Good morning. Please make your way on in. I think everybody has. You can go ahead and stand here while we get started. If you'd like to stand with us and let's do this. So great to see everybody today. cross you came and broke them down you broke them down there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you called me out of the grave you called me into the light you called my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. dead are coming back to life i'm back to life hear the song awaken all creation singing we're alive cause we're alive you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. What a love we found that can hold us down. We shout it out because we're alive, you're alive. What a love we found. Shout it out, it's you alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is Me. Oh, 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 oh. 
Thanks for the help, Simon. That sounded great. It's a good peppy one. Go ahead, Bryce. It's great to have everyone here this morning. Our call to worship this morning is a psalm of David, comes from a psalm of David, Psalm 63, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And I think that's particularly appropriate for weeks that we, many of us here this morning, I know, have felt maybe that we're in a wilderness and that we're needing refreshment. And he says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Let's worship. So we're going to play the old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We're going to, I'm going to put in just a little bit different than what's on the slide. I'm just going to start off with uh, Jesus, what a friend we have in Jesus. And then we'll, we'll do that at the end, so just so you're not surprised. And then we'll do the verses as normal. Please sing with me. Here we go. Jesus, what a friend we have in Jesus. Let's do it again. Jesus, what a friend we have in Jesus. and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Get to the Lord in prayer. Can we find? Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Get to the Lord in prayer. Heavy laden, comfort with the load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise for sake? In his arms will take and shield thee. We'll find a soul is there. Blessed Savior. Blessed Savior, thou hast promised. Thou will all our burdens bear. Rapture 
with praise and endless worship will us sweet portion there. What a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. One more time. Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All right. Amen. have a seat for just a minute. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning that I know we've done before, but not while I've been here. This is a time where we're going to confess our sins, take just a minute to confess our sins as a body uh, corporately. Last week we were in the book of Leviticus and we saw the rituals that God uses to bring us to worship. Uh, and that's one ritual that often the church uses uh, to come back before God weekly to remember the ways that I have sinned against him, that I have failed to live up to his perfect standard. Even as a believer, even as a person with a changed heart, we're called to confess our sins. And we see this in First John uh, chapter 1. John tells us this is the message that we've heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Part of walking in the light is admitting our sin before the father and consistently and continually repenting. So what I want us to do is to take a moment to uh, read this corporate confession together. This is a corporate confession that was written uh, centuries ago. So the language sometimes can sound a little bit distant, but I think it captures well how our hearts have wandered from God and gone against him. Let's read this together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done And by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. After confessing our sins, it is good to be reminded of the Lord's guaranteed pardon of our sins in Christ. And in the very next verse in 1 John, we see this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God. If you would uh, like to stand with one more song here before we take a break. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest flame but holy trust in Jesus name Christ 
seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the well my anchor holds within the well Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Good morning. Welcome to church. <clears throat> it says on here Elizabeth Myers is to do announcements, but you're stuck with me. So I am glad to be here. I've been gone for the last few weeks, vacation, etc. But it's good to be back. Good to see you all. A um, couple of announcements. First of all, if you're here in person, we're glad you're here. If you're here online, we're glad you're here as well. And we're going to be doing communion later. So if you're at home, you may want to get your communion set up um, during the break. Uh, a couple of announcements. Redeemer Youth is having our first annual summer kickoff party at Smith Mountain Lake. It's on June 26th, which is the day before my birthday, so I expect presents. Um, this is for sixth grade all the way up through high school. So if you have a rising sixth grader, and this might be their first event, this would be a great event. So talk to Lemorier. They'd be glad to have you. Um, so that's teens, and then we've got Smash Camp coming up for the kids. Smash Camp is science, math, arts, sports, helping, and the helping is the H. So Smash Camp stands for a lot of things. Wednesday nights, starting on June 22nd, all the way through July. So June 22nd through July 27th, Wednesday nights, Highland Park, Smash Camp, and that's for kids 6th grade and below. And they're going to be learning all sorts of cool stuff and doing some cool stuff. So talk to Austin if you have any questions on that. And then lastly, um, you saw if you saw the Friday Five, if you get the Friday Five, um, if you don't get the Friday Five, send an email to uh, Christ Our Redeemer, see core at Christ Our Redeemer, and let Priyana know you need to be on the Friday Five email list. But if you saw the Friday Five, you saw mention of our search for the music director. So we got the bright idea that uh, we needed to add a little more energy and experience and manpower to our search for the music director. So um, we've stood up a mini committee 
Um, and the committee has got Tim Winton on it, um, Chris Revis, uh, my wife Elizabeth, and Breon. And is that it? Was there anybody else? That was it. So they had their first meeting this past week, and we're looking for a music director. And we've been looking for a music director for a little while, but it's not, we, we want to add some more energy and focus on this. So they're going to be doing social media, they're going to be sending out emails, they're going to be doing all sorts of things to try to gin up interest, right? So there's the search for the director. So if you know of anybody, know of anybody's cousin who's, who happens to have an aunt who, who lives in Kentucky, but they know somebody here who plays guitar, whatever, we want, we want to talk to them, right? So uh, Tim is facilitating that. He's not in charge of it, but he's facilitating that. So talk to Tim, but look for communications from that group relating to the music director. On the other hand, if you have any music, musical talent, uh, kazoo, triangle, xylophone, accordion, recorder, if you have any musical talent whatsoever, we would love to have you talk to, um, talk to Bryce, talk to, uh, probably talk to Bryce, that would be our first starting place. Um, we, we, need, we need help, right? Our wonderful music team has done an outstanding job. Chris and Chris and Heather and, um, oh shoot, I'm forgetting a whole bunch of names, but Dre and everybody. But we need more. So if you've got any musical talent or know anybody who has a musical talent, you know, let us know, please. We'd love to get you. We don't, we're not going to ask you to lead, but we'd love to get you up there playing your instrument or singing if you can do that as well. So lots of announcements. With that said, we're going to go to break. So you, you may arise and children are dismissed and head over to Core Kids. And we'll be back here in a few.
Check, check, check. All right, folks. Let's head on back to your seats, please. <clears throat> Good morning. So the scripture this morning is from 1 Peter, 2nd chapter, verses 9 through 12, if you'd like to read along. 1 Peter, 2nd chapter, verses 9 through 12. <clears throat> but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvel marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Thank you, Tim, for reading. If you'll turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Tim read a passage from the Apostle Peter that Peter uses to command us and show us who we are as the body of Christ, as people of God, as a church. And Peter uses Old Testament language to do that. Peter doesn't come up with these terms that he uses, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. These are direct quotes from different places in the, in the Old Testament. When Peter sees what the people of God need to be and communicates that to us, what he does is he looks at the history of Israel and says, this is what God has always been doing in his people. So we're going to go to Deuteronomy this morning, and we're going to go to a difficult passage, and we're going to think about how this passage and how God's heart has shown in this passage and in this book lead us to understand more about who we are and ultimately about who our Savior and King is. We'll read just a few verses, verses 6 through 11. So Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 11. For you are a people holy... To the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. That the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with the one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord God, as we come before your word this morning, we pray that you would allow us not to come primarily with what we would like it to say, but to come humbly and to see how you communicate yourself to us. And how, Lord, this is the best news for us. That even when we're uncomfortable, and even when there are things that we cannot fully understand, things that end in mystery, Lord, that we know you are the loving, faithful, covenant-keeping God. And we pray that you would help us to see that this morning 
and to be changed by it. In the name of Jesus, by your spirit, we pray. Amen. When Jesus shows up in the Gospels, there are all sorts of questions about his identity. You see this especially in the Gospel of Mark. Mark doesn't jump in with a birth narrative like Matthew and Luke do. Matthew and Luke tell us a little bit about Jesus being born, and th those are the passages we go to and read at Christmas time. But Mark jumps in with all of these stories that, that, that begin at Jesus' public ministry. And Mark uses the word immediately over and over and over. If you go and read the first few chapters of Mark, you'll see it. It's, it's almost it's re repetitive. It's redundant. Immediately, immediately, immediately. Jesus is going from place to place, and all sorts of questions arise about who he is. Who is this man who's casting out demons, who's healing people, who has power like we've never seen before, who teaches with authority like we've never seen before? And we see one story uh, of just a few that show up in all four Gospels. There, there's very few stories that show up in all four Gospels, but we see one story that shows up in all four, that helps us to understand especially who Jesus is and who, what his identity is, and that's his baptism. When Jesus goes and he's baptized in the Jordan River by John, and John, remember, reluctantly baptizes him. He says, I'm not fit to untie your sandals, much less baptize you, my Lord. But John does baptize him, and, and we see a dove that represents the spirit, well, the spirit really represented by a dove, come down to, to, to Jesus and remains with him. And then we, see, we hear this voice from heaven. And the father says from heaven, this is my son. That is a key to Jesus' identity. That is a key to who Jesus is. Who on earth is this man who has such power, such authority over all things? Well, it's the son of God. We hear that term so much, the Son of God, Jesus is the Son of God, that we forget just how important it is. And what on earth does that mean, that he's the Son of God? We have an idea of what it means when we, when we think about the Trinity, God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but we're going to see this morning that it means much more than that. Jesus as the Son of God, Jesus being in his very identity, the Son of God, that's who he is, that's rooted in the Old Testament, that's rooted in a mission that God has had from the very beginning of his creation. And we see it here in the book of Deuteronomy. You may be surprised to learn that the book of Deuteronomy is all about God's love for his people. We think of the book of Deuteronomy as a book of law. But more than anywhere else in the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy shows us God's love for his people. It is a book of law. It's also a book of love. Those two things aren't opposed to each other. Those two things actually go together and are united. They're married in the book of Deuteronomy. God's love for us and his call to us to carry out his law, to change the way we live. In these verses, Moses begins by saying, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And that's where I'm really going to focus in this morning, is on this idea, this very difficult idea, that God has chosen you. Not only has he chosen his people, but he's chosen them to be his sons. This is what we see throughout the book of Deuteronomy, that God actually calls himself the father of his people. He doesn't call himself father very often in the Old Testament. But in the book of Deuteronomy, he calls himself the father of his people. And his people are the son of God. Israel as a whole is God's chosen firstborn son to carry out his mission into the world. That's what Israel is called to be the Son of God, chosen by him. Now, this idea that we're chosen by God is really difficult for us, especially as modern Westerners. It really actually is an affront to our sensibilities in many ways. 
to our sense of morality, to our sense of what's right. And I know that it's very, very difficult to navigate in terms of how we, we wrestle with this. God has chosen me, this idea that God has chosen me, and yet he calls me to respond in faith to him. And that's where I really want to sit this morning in this very difficult and controversial doctrine of election. You know, the word election we usually associate with, uh, with election of a president, election of a political leader, someone that we choose. This doctrine of election that shows up in Scripture and that shows up very clearly in this passage is a, is a, it's a doctrine, it's a truth about God that is really about him choosing his people, him coming down and having a one-way, unilateral, grace, undeserved, gracious, undeserved act toward his people that saves them. We don't like to hear this for a variety of reasons. And what I want to do is quickly run through just a few of the main objections that we have to this idea that God chooses us rather than the fact that we choose him. There are some primary objections that we have in, in, in our own American Christianity, and I want to show you how this passage actually anticipates those objections and cuts against them. It doesn't anticipate them in their exact modern form, obviously. The, the book of Deuteronomy is not written to Americans. It's written first to people in the wilderness about to enter Canaan. But it speaks to us, I think, in very clear ways. Your God has graciously chosen you in a sovereign, unilateral, free work of grace in your life, and that's why you are saved. The first reason that we're uncomfortable with this is that we feel that God's choosing, God's election of a people leads us to pride and arrogance. Okay? Uh, people like uh, Christopher Hitchens, who is a famous atheist, uh, who uh, railed against the morality of Christianity and other monotheistic faiths. Uh, he and others have, have found especially difficult this idea that God has chosen a people and see this as primarily a way for Christians to say, since I've been chosen by God, I have access to something that nobody else has, and that's some sort of uh, ability for me, it gives me some sort of ability to say that arrogantly that I have a moral superiority to you, that I have uh, uh, some sort of um, uh, access to, to revelation that you don't have, some sort of uh, better life than you have. And we see this all the time in our culture, that people see Christians this way, as being morally superior, as being, uh, as being uh, difficult to, to talk with because they have this sense of pride and arrogance. That's sort of the stereotype of Christians in our day and age. And unfortunately, too often, it's well-deserved. Unfortunately, too often, it's because of uh, the attitudes that we carry forth that because God has chosen us, we have some sort of moral superiority. But the reality is that one of the things Moses does in this passage is he anticipates that. He says, because God has chosen you, I, I know that you're going to feel morally superior, so let me immediately go in verse 7 and tell you why you can why, why God's choosing of you actually breaks down any ability for you to feel morally superior over anybody else. Verse 7, it was not because you were more in number than any, other, than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. Not that you were strategically helpful for the Lord, but actually because you were the least strategic. The very next chapter, he'll talk about, it's not because of your economic wealth or prowess, but it's because he gave it to you. And in chapter 9, the very next chapter, he'll talk about how the fact, it, it, the fact that it's not about how you were righteous. You are actually the most stubborn. God chose you not because of anything in you. That's hard for us to hear. He chose you not because of anything in you, but it destroys our ability to stand here and say that we have any sort of moral superiority over anybody else, whether they're believers or not. 
Because God has chosen us out of his pure love. It's all about the love that he has shown. There's no other reason given in this passage than his love for his people. It is impossible for us to have pride and arrogance and superiority in the face of the fact that God has chosen us in a unilateral, undeserved work of grace. I mean, think about it just a little bit. If, if, if I chose God and somebody else didn't choose him, if it's really rooted in the fact that I made some sort of decision for God, if that's the basis of my, uh, the foundation of my salvation, then I must have something in me that's better than that person. I must have something in me that, that allowed me to be more aware of God than that person did. The reality is there's nothing in me, not one bit of me, that draws me to God other than his love for me, his choosing. There's a second objection that we have that makes us uncomfortable with this idea of God's choosing, and that's that it leads to exclusivity and moral complacency. Exclusivity and moral complacency. The reality is that in this passage, Moses shows us that God's election actually, instead of exclusivity, it drives us to mission. God's election was all about mission from the very beginning. That it was never about creating an exclusive, harbored away people of God that was holy and got away from the world and all by themselves and had some sort of privilege. But that it was always about a mission of God for all of his creation to bring all of his people back into relationship with him. From the very beginning when he went to Abraham and promised him to save him. He said, I'm going to make you a blessing to the nations. John Calvin says that the very purpose of of the election of God's people is that God might acquire to himself a holy people free from all pollutions, but that then that holy people will go out and that God will carry his mission of purifying and cleansing people to the world. In Old Testament Israel, we see this as God creating a treasured possession for himself that's called to be separate, separate from the people around them, and also to be a witness to the people around them. That's why Deuteronomy is so full of laws. Because Deuteronomy actually shapes and forms this community that's designed to care for the poor and needy among themselves. That's designed to worship one God and one God only rather than many gods who are actually not gods, but false gods. Deuteronomy is designed to create a unique community that draws people in and shows the world what they were designed for, a community that functions in a way that flourishes. That's why Deuteronomy, this book about God's love, is so full of law as well, that God uses this to draw us and to shape us to shape his community as it's supposed to function. And this must be a separate community. And, and, and this is where I'm not going to be able to deal with the full difficulty of the context of this passage. But the context of this passage is that God calls his people to destruction of the Canaanites. And I don't want to hide that in this sermon. right? That this is, that's the context of this passage. We don't need to, to hide from the fact that God puts that in this passage. And that is morally very difficult and hard for us to solve, that God calls his people to wipe out the people that are in the land already. And the focus that he has in there is on their idols, their places of worship, and it's on creating a holy and a separate people. If we have more time, maybe we could talk a little bit more about the the ways that God God does this and how some of the reasons that he may have for this, that he shows us that he has for this. Uh, We don't have time to solve all those problems. And and if we had time, we wouldn't be able to solve all those problems. But the the point is that, that he calls them to be separate. He calls them to be a people who are utterly separate from idolatry, from things that would lead our hearts away from God. 
And this is a one-time thing that God calls his people to do to come into this land and to make this a pure land fit for God's dwelling. And we'll see in a minute how they utterly fail at that. But that's what he, he calls them to do. So he calls them to, not to exclusivity, exclusivity or moral complacency, but to mission. There's a third objection against this idea that God chooses us and we don't choose him. And this, the first two objections are, are practical objections. This one is a little bit more of an intellectual objection, a philosophical objection. It feels like God is being arbitrary. It feels like God is being arbitrary, and it feels like man is robbed of his free will, of his freedom. Okay, so something about God and something about man. And I put these together, these two objections together, because God, Moses sort of deals with these in the same way. Moses says that God's electing love demands active love in response. And it's a covenant love of God that demands a covenant love in response. He immediately goes to this idea of covenant. Now, covenants are foreign to us. Covenants are not something that we think about much in our modern world, but this is something that would have happened all the time in the ancient world. These were political arrangements. Sometimes political, sometimes even between friends, they might have happened. Uh, and it's almost like father-son agreements or parent-child agreements in general. Uh, we also see David and Jonathan making a covenant in the scriptures. Basically, the idea of a covenant is it's a relationship between two people or two actors that, that, that bind themselves to each other in a certain way. And many times in the ancient world, we see this with a greater king and a lesser king. So the covenant is not necessarily between two equal parties, but between a greater party, a powerful party, and a lesser party that come into relationship and bind themselves. The greater party might say, I protect you in exchange for your service to me. So God uses this sort of analogy, this picture of covenants that would happen in the ancient world, of binding agreements to communicate his love, his faithful love to us. He says, I am not a covenant breaker. I've chosen to bind myself to you. That charge that God is arbitrary can be met with the fact that God never had to bind himself to anybody, but he chose to come in and make a covenant with his people. Now, that doesn't fully solve the problem. It's still hard to know why God chooses some people and doesn't choose others. It's hard to know why he chose Israel and not Canaan. We don't know. He doesn't give us an answer other than his covenant love. But at some point, we just have to submit to the fact that God has purposes and doesn't do it in an arbitrary way. There's a Jewish scholar named John Levinson who talks about how, how grace and arbitrariness are really hard to tell apart. Think about the idea that grace, actually giving somebody to some, something to somebody, a gift, it, it feels almost necessarily arbitrary. Because if it's not arbitrary from our point of view, if it's not just grace given to somebody for no reason at all, then, then I'm giving it to them for a reason. I'm giving it to them for something in return, right? Grace and arbitrariness are really hard to tell apart <laughs> because that's the nature of grace. God loved us because he loved us. There's no other reason given. That's the covenant love of God for you. And man is not robbed of his free will in this process. God brings you into relationship that actually makes you who you were supposed to be. The covenant, one theologian says, doesn't deaden human beings or treat them as puppets. Instead, it embraces them as whole people. It doesn't take away their power. Instead, it shatters their powerlessness. The famous hymn, by Charles Wesley, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin in darkest night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. God's one-sided, undeserved grace frees you to be an active participant in his community. And as his people, one last concern, one last charge against this idea that God's choosing is a good thing for us. And this is, is more of an existential concern. 
This is more of an existential objection that God's choosing leads people to doubt their salvation. If it's God who chose me and I didn't choose God, then how on earth can I know that I'm saved? How on earth can I know that he chose me? The reality is, we really could turn this on its head. If it's I that chose God, and I look at the patterns in my life, and I look at the ways that I continue to fail, and the ways that I continue to struggle, how on earth could I be sure that my choosing was legitimate? But my, choosing, or my salvation is not based on my choosing. My salvation is based on God's choosing. My, my salvation is based in something that is an unending love for me that calls me to respond and calls me to act but doesn't base my salvation on how well I do. But it's on how well God has done in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's where we arrive at Jesus' identity as the Son of God. In this passage where God says that he will not give up his covenant and calls his people to active obedience, calls his people to follow the law, we see, as it were, a, a ray of light on God's purposes for his people. But when Jesus shows up, that ray of light gets, gets, uh, gets spread out into, I can't think of the word, <laughs> uh, but it gets spread out into, gets refracted, there it is, into a glorious display of all, of all that light held in it. That light, when it gets reflect, refracted, gets spread out into a rainbow of colors, into beauty, into fullness. We get to see it in its fullness. We saw the light in Deuteronomy, but we see the light refracted and grown in the person of Jesus. Because this chosen people who God called to be his treasured possession is the very same people that continuously and egregiously rebelled against the Lord over and over and over in the Old Testament. The story of the Old Testament is the story of God electing a people and them rebelling against him in response. It's the story of God choosing people and them failing their end of the bargain. That's the story of the Old Testament. People who, who become murderers, thieves, liars, adulterers. The picture in the Old Testament is, is of, of a, a wife who's been married by God and is then gone and in, in had, had relationships with all other sorts of men. That's the picture. That God's love is met with other abandonment and rejection by his people. And the astounding reality is that in Jesus, God freely chooses to enter what Karl Barth calls the, the far country. That God doesn't decide to stay in heaven, but he chooses to enter this far country, and he descends from heaven, and he accepts full responsibility for all the unfaithfulness, all the deceit, all the murders, all the rebellion of his people. That Jesus, God himself, who is the son of the father eternally, chooses to become the chosen son of God that Israel should have been as a human being. The eternal son of God becomes the chosen human being who has rejected and he, God, and he, and he accepts full responsibility for that rejection. That's the glory of what Jesus has done. That's his identity as the son of God, is that he's the chosen one who has rebelled. Of course, Jesus hasn't rebelled, but he stands before God and he says, you are right in proclaiming that I have rebelled because I'm taking the place of my people. And this expands, it makes so much greater all of these answers to the objections that we've seen where Moses calls us to humility rather than to pride and arrogance. Well, in the face of what Jesus has done, how on earth could we have moral superiority as brothers and sisters? And Paul says that we were dead. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once walked. We were dead, but God, who is rich in mercy, has made us alive in Jesus Christ. You were dead, now you are alive. The great Anselm, a thinker in the medieval uh, 
I have a long prayer written out here. I'm not going to read that prayer of Anselm. It's this beautiful, beautiful prayer. But, but what he says is, at the end of it, is I acknowledge, Lord, and I give thanks to you that you have created your image in me so that I remem- may remember you, think of you, love you. But this image is so effaced and worn away by my own vice, so darkened by the smoke of sin that it cannot do what it was made to do unless you renew it and you reform it. I do not try, Lord, to obtain to your lofty heights because my understanding is in no way equal to it. And this is one of the smartest men in the history of the world. But I do desire to understand your truth a little, that truth my heart believes and loves. For I do not seek to understand so that I may believe, but I believe so that I may understand. As Christians, we can never have superiority over others. This is why things like attaching our own culture or our nation to our Christian faith is so insidious. It's because God chose the people of Israel. He chose them as his son. He elected them, not because of anything in them, but then as his people now, who Peter told us we are that same people, that treasured possession, we are not people because of who our what our culture is or where we were born or what color skin we have or whatever it is, this, none of these are bases for God's choosing us. We know this, but, but, but so often we get these things confused and we begin to bind together our cultural preferences with our Christianity. This is why that's so insidious because God has cut out any room for that. You have no room for superiority on your own basis. It's all from him. This, it, this drives us to humility. It also calls us to mission, as we saw. It calls us to, to mission, and Jesus' mission expands that. And we see this mo- most clearly in the fact that Jesus has come, and he's dined with sinners. He didn't choose to be among the powerful. The God of the universe chose to be among those who were j- rejected by society. He chose to go to Zacchaeus' house, the person who everybody knew was a fraud, the person who everybody hated. He chose to eat with people who struggle with drunkenness or in prostitution. These are the people that Jesus was with and associated with. His cleanness he allowed not to become something that that became unclean by other people, but he, in his power, made other things clean through his presence. What a beautiful thing that he went in mission to others, and this is our call too. Jesus calls us to hate sin so much that we would cut off our arm or gouge out our eye if it caused us to sin. That's language that, well, I don't encourage you to actually physically do that. (laughs) But it shows the seriousness of Jesus' call. We shouldn't just put it away as a metaphor. We 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 should see it as a serious call to separation just like that serious call to Israel going into the land of Canaan. It's a serious call to separation. It's a serious call to go out and to witness to other people. Because God chose us, it actually empowers our witness. It empowers our evangelism. It empowers our ability to go out and to say, despite the fact that the devil is working in the hearts of others, despite the fact that the devil does not want people to come to God, clouds them, Despite people's sin, despite people's hate of me, God is the one who saves. And I get to be a witness of that. That's the only reason our evangelism could ever work. It's the only reason our witness could ever work. This drives us to boldness, to patience in our evangelism too, and to prayer. It demands a response of love in the face of the love that we have been shown That covenant love that God showed us is reflected ultimately in the person of Jesus. And if you'll turn just briefly with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll end here in Ephesians chapter 1 before we partake of the Lord's Supper together. Ephesians chapter 1. In this chapter, Paul lays out a beautiful picture of of God's choosing us. And I want you to notice what he does. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ 
with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, that is Christ. If we read on, we would see it over and over and over. In him, in Christ, in Christ, in him. God didn't choose you. He chose you united to Christ. His choosing of you is absolutely, utterly inseparable from his choosing of Christ, from his choosing of his son. And that's why Jesus being the son of God is good news for you and for me if we come to him and if we are united to him. That, that the Bible is the greatest love story that's ever been told, but the Bible is not ultimately a love story about God for his people. The Bible is ultimately more deeply a love story about God for his son. The father loving the son. And because of that, he loves you. Because of that, we are called to respond in love. We are called to respond in changed lives because of his covenant love for you that's enabled you to act, that's given you power to act, and this gives us such deep comfort. Thomas Goodwin, the great Puritan theologian, who commented on this passage in Ephesians 1 in a way that, that cuts against our normal thinking. In our individualistic culture, we like to see it as God choosing each individual separately. But God has chosen us in Christ. And Goodwin says this, therefore, in as sure we are chosen in Christ and therefore are in as sure a condition as for final perishing as Christ himself. Now that's old English language there, but this is what he's saying, that, that your condition is just as sure as Christ is. That I don't have to worry about has God chosen me, has he not. If I love Christ, look to him for my comfort, for my assurance, to know that as sure as God chooses him, he's chosen me if I'm united to him. And all this, God delights in you. He calls you his treasured possession. If you don't know God, I didn't talk about this phrase in the passage, but God does say in that same passage that he repays those who hate him. That's uncomfortable for us too, and we don't like to talk about that either. But just as all-consuming and wonderful as his love is, that's the same that same love is all-consuming against anything that would threaten his rule and his reign. If you feel drawn to him this morning, come. Come to him. He has chosen you if you are united to Christ. If and only if you are united to Christ. So come to him. Be united to Christ. Believe. Repent of your sins. Follow this king who has so given us a gift that is so undeserved because he loves us and for no other reason. Let's go to the Lord's table and let's pray as we do. Lord God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your one-way, unilateral, undeserved, gracious act of love toward us. Thank you that you have made us your treasured possession, but that you have done it in Christ. It's not dependent on anything that we bring to the table. And Lord, you call us to your table. Lord, you call us to receive this gift freely from you at your table, this grace upon grace that feeds us, that sustains us, that brings us back to you over and over and over. And Lord, help us to do that all of our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we go to the Lord's table, if I could have a couple elders come up. What we'll do is we will serve communion this morning by having elders on either side of this, where this podium is. That's heavier than I thought. Uh, uh, on either side of this podium. And if you would come... Uh, down the middle aisle, receive communion, and then
uh, in turn go out to the outside and, and you can return to your seats. And as you receive it, receive it, partake, take a moment. I encourage you in your seats to, uh, to just ponder what Christ has done, what God has done for you. Jesus calls us. He says, come all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The call is to the weary. The call is to the burdened. The call is to rest in God. That is his call to you this morning. And as believers, he calls us again and again to come to his table where he has given us his flesh. His body and his blood poured out for us. And Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians, reminds us to come back to this table over and over saying this. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. Was that that same covenant made new. The new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Come to the table if you know him, if you believe in him, if you're united to him, and God is giving you his grace even through this meal. Let's pray and then come forward. Lord God, it is only by your grace that we are your people. Lord, in this act that you call us to do over and over to receive your grace, I pray that you would set aside these elements from their common use. Lord, we are being drawn up into your holiness, even as you have already made us holy. Lord, help us to receive grace that drives us forward to mission, to humility, to love. And ultimately, Lord, to know how sure our salvation is in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Grand earth has quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. for me to not believe even when my eyes can't see and the 
this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. It is well. to urgently get your kids or something go for it come back but uh we'll try not to take forever here it's a good one so I 
worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. in every heart I worship you I worship you you are here healing every heart I worship you I worship you you are here turning lives around I worship Here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are may make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way Keep the light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep the light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep the light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. 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 Miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Let's try again. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Amen. We have been called together to worship the living God. We have received freely. Now let us give freely. He has made known to us the path of life. Now let us not conceal it from our neighbors. Our citizenship is in heaven. But our homes are in the red earth. Our only hope as we return to our vocations is in you, O Lord. <coughs> Sustain us in our labor of love. Inspire us with works of faith. Knit us together in our common lives of grace. Do perfectly good things through our imperfect lives in the coming week through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And amen. Let's, so let's pick it up at. <laughs> i 
see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. That is who you are.